Good morning. Those of you listening to this on podcast are really missing some seasonal sights as we have our last episode of The View for 2018, <laughs> a year many of us might be glad to say goodbye to. Christina Rivera, I'm not going to say, Charlottesville, what are you doing in Charlottesville? <laughs> How are you this morning? <laughs> I love you, Meg. Uh, uh, this is Christina Rivera, and I am coming to you from Charlottesville, where it's just, um, you know, lovely winter weather. These are the moments where I was like, now, why did I leave Los Angeles again? How how is that a good decision? No, just kidding. I, I love our family out here and but I do miss home right around this time. So for any of you out there missing home, I'm right there with you. And uh, we will make home where we are. And Aisha, where are you coming from? Hi, I'm Aisha Hauser and I'm in uh, Whoville. That's why the hat. Uh, also known as Seattle. <laughs> And it is rain. It's been raining for it was just. Was, I understand it makes Santa Jessica super happy, the rain. So it's been nice and um, just stereotypical Seattle weather. So uh, Santa Jessica, how are you? I'm up at the North Pole like I am this time of year. <laughs> I won't say why. <laughs> I'm also on uh, Twitter hashtag the view, and I'm on Facebook fielding your questions and comments and um yeah happy to be here who's next michael good morning everyone this is michael tino joining you as usual from peekskill new york <laughs> where uh, where it is a beautiful cold winter day and it, it is about to rain like heck here but right now it's sunny so it's good to, it's good to be with you I neglected to say Minneapolis, Minnesota is, has been unseasonably warm. It's really weird. The snow's melted. It's rainy. I mean, it's, you know, for late December, it's really odd. I'm sure it's not a good thing, but I have to admit I'm enjoying it because it's not icy and I don't have to put on 17 layers every time I go out. And yesterday the dog got loose at the dog park. And I mean, she's always loose, but she wouldn't come for like an hour. So I, was really happy that it wasn't 10 below or something although I thought maybe if it was she might have come faster because <laughs> maybe the squirrels would hibernate anyway okay I know I need a dog trainer nobody needs to tell me that I know so <laughs> today we're going to do something different and do a year in review and really kind of look at some of where we've been in 2018 uh, Jessica Claus will read us what we talked about in different months, and then we'll share reflections um, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 months later. So, Jess, start us off. Okay, so I need to remove, it's hard to actually breathe with a beard on. So, I'm, <laughs> I need to remove that. Um, okay, so let's see. We are, um, Starting in January, our first show of the year was Lareda Fall Con Lessons Learned. Um, Why don't you we tell us the whole month and then we'll, we'll so jump So then we it. had um, Multicultural Centering with Sana Saeed. And then we had uh, Running for Office as a Matter of Faith with Carlton Elliott Smith. And then we had UU Youth Ministry with Bart Frost. And I'll just note that um, India Harris joined Sana on the multicultural, oh, right. multicultural centering. Um, yes. With an uncredited appearance on the view. <laughs> As we have. Um... Well, let's, Aisha, I see you about to say something. I'm, I'm interested because then, of course, we bookended this Lareda show with another one later in the year. So as you look back on on that Lareda show, I'm trying, you know, that was, that was really looking at some major mistakes and trying to recover. Yeah, I think the, um, what is heartening about the, the public lessons learned from uh, Lareda Fall Conference in Denver 2017 um, was just that, that it was very public, that there was the whole conference fell apart at, or at least transformed into something different. 
And then it was, hey, let's look at this and how did we come together? How did we change it? And it was what was inspiring and continues to be is that there was time and effort given to, um, instead of wallowing in guilt or shame, it was, hey, how can we make this better and different and learn, which is to me part of faith development and part of learning. And one of the things that I don't think we've done well, it's more, let's get rid of the problem. Let's you know, shove it under the rug and we're all tripping over these lumpy rugs because um, there's crap underneath and we don't face it. And so uh, that's, I think, the gift of the Lareda in, in our Unitarian Universalism when we invite ourselves into a lessons learned. Um, and so I've, and, and this, and we did talk about this year's fall conference. It was amazing. And so um, it, it brought in many more voices and, and talents and people from Lareda who did workshops. But the bigger picture for me was what does it look like when there is um, a breach of trust and then what does it look like to come back together and restoration continues this isn't it wasn't a one-time thing this has been oh okay this is what we can and we're going to mess up again it's messy it's a practice i had a friend who says don't say mistakes say uh reverend natalie fenimore she said say practice this is a practice and so what and and, and what better place to practice than a faith communion christina well, what do you think or meg yeah no christina about Loretta, go on um, so I think it was really, um, I think one of the things that I took away from, from FalCon, both FalCon 2017 to 2018, is the facility with which uh, religious educators really seem to be embracing this work and, um, and leading this work in many ways. And I think that you know, I, I come back to that question of why is that? Why do we continue to see religious educators, um, you know, at the forefront of leadership and what and and really kind of having a moment um, of recognition of what has always been there? Um, and so, you know, part of it is yeah. And I've asked this question, you know, in religious educators, different religious educators' spaces to get people's take on it and. Um, I think a lot of it comes from the, the inclination of religious educators to educate, to be inquisitive, to wonder why, and to not necessarily take um, not knowing, which is a very white supremacy, you know, fear of not knowing or not seeming capable or, or not having the answer, and turning that into an opportunity to learn and to explore and to um, and to know more. And, and I find that curious because that's really where our faith is rooted, um, you know, is in the not knowing, is not being sure, and, um, and exploring where that takes you. And so, um, you know, I just, you know, it's, it, religious educators say it's, it's all for faith formation all the time. And, and this particular, you know, transformation of Loretta Falcons really felt that, and it felt like that to me, is that it, it was, you know, there was that briefest moment of, oh shit, oh crap, you know, we, we really fucked this up and, and are we gonna be able to, to come out of it? And then really set that aside, uh, was, was able to set that aside and, you know, not make it about that, um, but make it about, Let's explore why, and not just not just go immediately to the to the fix it. Also, to remain um, in that really uncomfortable place together for a whole weekend, for you know more than a weekend, um, and afterwards, and then come back and say, okay, um, you know, let's try and repair some of the hurt, but then also change what we're going to do in the future. Um, and I I just think that there's something really beautifully spiritual in that practice um, that our wider faith needs to really examine and explore. Because we come from, I think we've talked about this on the show, we come from, you know, uh, or we come, we have this dominant tradition within us as a faith community that the minister knows everything and that it is all knowing and, and, and somehow, um, that just, that doesn't serve us well. It doesn't serve us well. It doesn't serve 
ministry well. It doesn't serve, you know, ministerial formation well. And um, so, yeah, the, the exploration part of it really made me excited. Well, yeah. speaking, I was going to say, and so I'm segueing a little bit to another show, which is about youth. So, Michael, if you want to talk more about Laredo, why don't you jump in now? I, I just wanted to say, as especially as a minister who knows very little, um, <laughs> that in, in my experience, uh, religious educators have consistently been at the, the forefront of our anti-oppression efforts, whatever they, they are like in the moment. And I think part of that comes from being religious professionals who are marginalized from from power in our congregations and in our association. So um, I hope I hope religious educators stay on the forefront, even as they they gain more institutional power uh, in our association. Um, you know, I was just talking yesterday with the religious educator. I work. I'm honored to work with Tracy Brenham, and and she was mentioning the program that uh, religious educators are piloting, looking at dismantling white supremacy in RE programs and being accountable for that. And Aisha, I'm, you know more about that than, <laughs> than I do, but you know, I, I just, I sort of noted, of course, yes, this is happening first in, in our RE programs because that's, you know, that's what, how things happen. <laughs> you know, they happen first in our youth movement and they happen first in our RE programs. And, you know, the ministers who know very little um, are usually, you know, the last to catch on to, to these things. So. Well, and so you mentioned youth as well. I wanted to shout out to Bart Frost, who was our guest, um, who just mentioned is watching today, um, because I think all of us here are wildly committed to youth and in a number of shows have expressed uh, dismay about the lack of institutional support for all kinds of youth and particularly marginalized youth um, in terms of holding on to the faith. You know, really, what would it what would it mean if we actually committed ourselves to keeping the people who are already here versus, you know, going out and finding some seekers somewhere that we always seem to be talking about. And um, yeah, that that show. And so many of the discussions about youth, just I think a revolution is needed to demand another youth organization that's uh, youth led with adults. Um, but yeah, just shout out to Bart and to all of the people who are working with youth and to, especially to the youth. I don't think a lot of them listen to this show, but if you are, you are a special indeed. <laughs> and um, we so need that leadership and we, we've heard it on so many shows about so many topics it's just one of the threads that comes through the youth need their own view i think their own like podcast Ooh, that would be great <laughs> wouldn't it it would i think one of my um what, what i've watched happen with unitarian universalism and youth ministry is um there was a time where there was adults including youth in a way that was actually faith formation and ministry. And now it's turned into, let's have a youth here to be here to make us feel better. It's obviously not what people say, but it comes across that way rather than, well, what does it genuinely mean to make space in a, in a way that we are affirming that this is your, uh, this is our faith. Um, because what I see that, um, other faiths do better. And I, I hate to do that, but I will do it. Um, I don't see many ministers coming out of seminary focusing on youth ministry as village educators do it, but we're expected to. We're the babysitters. I put that in quotes. Um, but what would it look like if actually part of, and I really don't want to be like, ministers get better. I just think it's something I've noticed. We don't have a track for ministers coming out of faith for um, uh, ministerial formation and passing the MFC and saying, my goal is youth ministry. And what would it, what would it be for us if, if we did have any semblance of that? Um, because there's almost, I mean, I've heard, you know, I think I've said this before where ministers avoid children and youth. And it's like, why are we ordaining people who avoid anyone under 18? Like, what is that? And how, what does that mean for ministry? So 
I think I wonder what it would look like to um, actually affirm um, ministry of all ages in truth and even among ministerial formation. Um, so I wonder out loud. Yeah, and I think what I wonder what what it would look like to institutionally support that, um, because I think a lot of folks don't go into youth ministry because there's you know you come out of seminary, you come out of ministerial formation in you know in deep debt, um, and the positions that are available you know for youth ministry are generally, you know, in our congregation stipended, not even, not even like full-time positions. Um, and so what it would look like from an institutional perspective to say, you know, you are going into ministry and we're going to, and you want to focus on youth ministry, well, we're going to give you an additional stipend to your, you know, to your job um, salary in order to do that. So we're incentivizing the, the change that we want to see, you know, what if we have folks who are, you know, going into community ministry to, uh, to serve marginalized populations, um, what does it look like to be giving them stipends in order to, you know, on top of whatever their um, salaries are in order to do that work. So I think, you know, I think there's a desire there to do that. I think our ministerial formation process, as it currently stands, you know, what what chance in heck do we have of, of producing folks that a have still have that desire at the end of the ministerial formation, and uh, have the resources to do it? Well, even those of us who go to seminary with that commitment, I, I know I went to a UCC seminary, there was one week long class on youth ministry, which I took. And then um, when the UUA hired me in 1989 to do the job that Bart Frost is doing a version of now, I remember saying to them, I'm really honored. And also I'm really freaked out if I'm the most qualified person, genuinely. I mean, I just was like, I know very little about this, actually. Seriously, there isn't somebody better than me because there should be a lot, there should be like many people better than me at this. And, um, and I think, you know, we all know the fabulous um, youth advisors who many of them do it for decades, literally. And, and the people who came out of even LRY who are now retiring, but for whom that was foundational. We just had the daughter of one of them last week talking about what that meant to her father. And um, I, I just, I, I feel like we don't value the reality that the youth are living with. And of course they're on the front lines of so many of the things that for some of us were comfortably looking at in the news or something. And yeah, I, I just, I, I know Elizabeth Wynn, who, who now runs Side with Love, but came out of youth organizing. Her um, centering question in life is, what if success meant creating other leaders who are stronger than we are, which comes out of youth work? And it's such an amazing question. If we all lived with that question of what success meant, we would be such a different um, faith than we are. I, when she told me that question, I burst into tears. I was like, I've been waiting for that question. But you know, um, yeah, and I see Bart Frost is actually writing that a lot of Christian denominations and churches do have um, a pipeline of people who are youth ministers who move into senior ministry. And, um, and that's certainly true. When I talk to older ministers, that a lot of them back when LRY was strong, did youth ministry out of seminary. Um, I think it's kind of weird, though, when we assume that because someone's 34, they're going to be good at it, you know, and because they're 50, they won't be. Because I, I think genuinely it's about being interested in other people and being willing to listen. So, But I'm thinking we should move on to February. We're not going to get through the year. Well, so for February... Um, we had Julica Herman de la Fuente uh, talking about our anti-racism work, creating accountability in our UU world, which was a great show. Um, we had a UU roundup then <laughs> when, when we wanted to talk about what we had been up to. 
Um, and then we had Wendy Von Quarter come on and talk about the complexities of civil discourse. And then we had Heather Vickery with the UUCSJ programs. So I want to jump in and say, <laughs> Um, because when uh, Julika came on, um, Robin's book hadn't been published yet, I don't think. How long is, was White Fragility just out this year, June? Um, so if I can recommend one book to every single white UU, it would be White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. Because I think some of existentially what's happening in many congregations, or at least uh, talking to colleagues and what I'm witnessing, experiencing myself is almost white fragility on steroids. And people do have a desire to learn. People don't know what they don't know. So, I, and she has a whole chapter on anti-blackness, which I don't think we talk about enough. Um, so that's my suggestion. Julica was great. And I wanna just add to it and say, do a book. Now there's a study guide that Gail Forsyth Vale wrote about white, um, on the book, White Fragility. Well, I'll jump in and, and say that the Wendy Von Quarter um, show was one of one of the shows we've done, which has upset people. And since we talk about real things and they include conflict and disappointment, um, why not talk about what we do? Uh, Wendy was talking and we had her on talking about the way I was looking at it, how to deal with a complex topic in a community. Uh, the topic that she was dealing with, which in my mind was secondary to that complexity thing was about the Middle East. And some of the Jewish UUs were very upset not to have been included in that conversation. And, um, and you know, it just got into some of the complexity of identities within our movement for me um, that, yeah, we, we don't um, wanna leave people out. And at the same time, we may be looking at things you know, without including all of the perspectives that someone else would, would walk into it with. So what I remembered about that was, you know, Wendy really being very, very inclusive in her town in terms of who she was reaching out to, but also taking a whole lot of heat for showing a movie, which on the surface seemed kind of in my naive mind, <laughs> kind of non, not a big deal movie, but apparently it really, really is. And so I think, Within Unitarian Universalism, this is to say the obvious, the Middle East is a really hard thing to talk about um, within our movement. And we've seen it at General Assembly sometimes. And I think it's, um, I think we really need to figure out some ways to have those conversations, probably not on this show, probably not publicly, but we really need to bring some people together or we don't, I don't, I, I'm not even one of the affected people, but I know for Muslim UUs and Jewish UUs particularly, or people with identities in those backgrounds and Asia's living in the family with both, um, you know, the, this stuff gets really emotional and very personal. And, and so it's one of those things that, I seem to be on a day of quoting Elizabeth Wynn, but one of her other things I love is she says, for some people it's the news, for other people it's family, you know? And so for people, you know, I think part of my commitment is to remember who's family and be sure that the people for whom things are very personal are included in our conversations. And I think it's also, you know, it's worth noting just for a moment without necessarily needing to talk about it in depth, that both anti-Semitism and Islamophobia exist in Unitarian Universalism. And, uh, you know, so when we, when we bring up topics like this, you know, Jewish UUs um, recall all of the times that they faced anti-Semitism in Unitarian Universalism. And Muslim UUs recall all the times that they faced Islamophobia in Unitarian Universalism. And uh, so, you know, just by bringing up the subject, we are inviting people to to recall periods of of struggle and trauma that they've they've been through in our faith. Um, this is one of those topics that even the most reasonable, brilliant people in my life cease to become so when it comes to Israel and Palestine. So um, there is I don't there's no it, it is so charged um and painful and i do live it i'm an arab married to a jewish man so um this is very personal but i i don't really 
it, it, it's not gonna get less charged. <laughs> So this might be a, a good moment to segue into one of the things that we did this year, which was a series of shows on the different identities in UUism. We did um, a show on UU Christianity. We did UU Earth Centered. We did UU Jewish Identity, UU Humanism. Um, I think that was that. Um, so yeah, so we did a whole bunch of of those as well. Yeah, and again, the the UU Christianity one caused pain for people. Um, I was maybe on a little bit of a tear about liberal versus liberation theology, which is something that I'm personally struggle with, and so I think. Um, it, I got a little emotional myself, uh, it, which wasn't great as a host, um, because I'm trying to figure out how Unitarian Universalists, especially white people, can be in a liberation mode. And, um, and be, as Michael said, because people have historic experiences of being oppressed, excluded, all kinds of things within Unitarian Universalism, it's this weird thing that Christianity is this dominant religion in the world, which is quite obnoxiously dominant, but within Unitarian Universalism, the anti-Christians can also be quite obnoxiously dominant. So, you know, it's, it's a, they're complicated. And, and again, um, it was a complicated show and, um, you know, it, we're, we're just, these, these conversations, we're going to have emotions. They're not going to be easy. And I wish, I wish sometimes I were a little smoother with stuff, but I think it's still really important to try to have the conversations. And we've been trying ever since to have a liberation centered um, Christian show with black people on it, which we haven't gotten yet. But, but, um, but speaking of black people, Tony Penn talking about humanism, I remember all of our brains, our heads were kind of spinning. That man's brain is the fastest brain I've ever, I, I literally went and read his whole website afterwards to try to take in some of what he had said. Like, uh, so, I, so if you're listening to this and you didn't hear that show, I really commend it to you. It was, it was intellect on steroids. It was highly just about humanism in really creative, interesting ways. Other people have that experience too. You know, that show in particular has stayed with me the rest of the year because there was one thing that he said um, that, you know, he's sort of been in and out of UU communities for a long time. And he said he would definitely join one if um, that community on a regular basis asked the question, how does being here make you a better person? Um, and uh, I actually have a conversation period in my worship services um, that, you know, where many people would have a story or a time for all ages, I have a conversation with the congregation. And I have taken to about once a quarter asking that question in the conversation. How does being here, how has being here made you a better person? How has being part of this community made you a better person? And the answers are, are simply marvelous that, that the folks in, in the congregation I serve um, have come up with, but so so it it remains with me. And Tony Penn, if you're ever in New York, um, come come visit uh, the UU Fellowship of Northern Westchester, and I promise I'll ask that question when you show up that morning. So we could segue from that into our show um, with Doug M Muter. Is that how you say his name, Muter? Even acknowledging my own racism is controversial. <laughs> <laughs> talk about being a better person. Aisha, you're, you're muted. Sorry, I was, my husband's feeding the dogs and I'm telling him to be quiet, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but that was what was interesting about that show because this is also something why I'm recommending Robin's book is people, even when white folks say, hey, here's my learning, there's still pushback. You didn't learn that. You're st you're saying something about me. It's still super fascinating. So I was really glad we had him on because that was just. I mean, you, it's almost. See, that's when I say it's not. It's not about the language. It's that there's folks who are committed to misunderstanding reality. And so, what do you do with that? 
it is particularly weird when they tell you you're not having your own reality about something. Uh, yeah, I remember somebody reporting to my boss that I was very, very upset about a conversation about racism. This was years ago. And my boss came to me and said, were you very upset? And I said, no, I wasn't the least bit upset. It was a really good conversation. And, and um, my boss said, well, the person said, you're, we're going to say that, but you don't know how upset you really were. <laughs> and I was just like, how the hell do I get out of this? You know, this person clearly knows everything about me that I don't know. So, you know, but yeah, it is, it, it's a, a horrible um, byproduct of entitlement. <laughs> I think not only do I know everything about the world, I know all about you too. <laughs> like, so yeah, that was, um, that, I remember that was a, just a good discussion um, about how we tell our truths. Christina, were you gonna say something? Oh, I was gonna say it was, it was actually, it came at a really helpful time, you know, professionally for me to be able to, I forwarded that view episode um, and to my board, the congregational board, um, just as something to, to talk about. Because when I came to the board, I was at a board meeting and I was describing our conversation, um, folks were just like, now what now? And, um, you know, just the, the idea of identifying as racist, of, you know, out loud um, was just, you know, it can be really hard for, <laughs> people and which blows my mind I'm like really I mean like now um and and so it, it was a really great opportunity for folks to hear it talked about in a setting that didn't put them on the spot um because we were on the spot <laughs> and um and I got I got feedback from, from some board members about how helpful that that episode was um, to hear. Uh, a lot of a lot of boards and congregational groups use episodes, which I'm delighted to hear about. It's a great use of the view. Jess, were you about to come in with some more? Yeah, I was going to say um, we also in this sort of same track, we spoke with Julie Taylor about forgiveness, which was a great show as well. Uh, Julie's now at Meadville, so that's that's a good move. Um, yeah, I remember learning that Julie Julie had written a dissertation on on forgiveness and being like, "There's something we don't really talk enough about." I think, especially in the realm of this work, where we all need massive amounts of forgiveness for ourselves and each other in order to do, uh, you know, to try to live ethical lives that are accountable to one another. We're gonna screw it up over and over. And I think the deeper in we get, the more we feel the pain that we're inflicting. I think those of us who are white, who are in that denial, per partly we're in it so to not feel what we're putting out, you know? And so once you start realizing that you've hurt people, um, it's really painful. You're like, oh shit, I didn't mean to make people's lives worse and I did. But that's the, and we don't have repentance either because we're so attached to our intention that people don't even know they need to ask for forgiveness and repent and say, hey, I may have had good intentions, but I get that the impact on you was pain and, and how can I heal this pain or what can I do to make this right um, or make amends. So we don't repent and we don't make amends and that would be part of forgiveness rather than, I think asking for forgiveness is incomplete without repentance which I, I know I'm using. Yeah, or atonement. I mean, yeah, make it restoration, which we do want to have a show on restoration coming up in the new year uh, to really well, talk about. Yeah, yeah we, I think in that show, we, we maybe even showed um, the graphic uh, that Leslie Mack does from the Interracial John podcast of what really takes it takes to make an apology and that it isn't just the saying, I'm sorry and the asking for forgiveness, that there's actually has to be identification of the harm done, um, you know, a seeking to, to correct that and to, re, to heal that before the ask of forgiveness can, can even be considered. And, um, you know, I, I, pull that, I pull that graphic out um, frequently, more frequently than I would hope for, but, um, both when 
someone is seeking forgiveness from me and I feel like, wow, this doesn't feel right. And I wonder why. Um, and I can look at that and go, oh, that's why. Um, and also when I know that I've done harm and, and am seeking a way to, um, to make that right. And, and remembering it's not about making me feel better, um, but <laughs> it's about making the other person feel better. Hey, Julie Taylor's watching. Hey, Julie. Saying apology without repentance and amends is lacking. But yeah, lacking. <laughs> That's for sure. Well, and I, I wonder about the relationship between, um, you know, as you use our, our belief and our faith that we are all okay, exactly as we are, but like, we need to have a process of be, you know, being okay, exactly as we are, but also like, we need to be better. <laughs> like, how do we, you know, create that awareness? Um, well, there's a difference between a firm, well, it's to me, affirming, we all affirm each other's humanity. We don't affirm all behavior. We screw up because we're right. talking about behavior. Not affirmation is something we hold as part of our universal faith and who we are. It's behavior. It's like what, um, what I learned from Meg, Reverend Meg, Meg Barnhouse. I believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every person, not every idea. So to me, that's what that speaks to. Well, and there's, you know, I think it also speaks to there being a certain amount of like, you might not be broken right now. You, you might be whole, but that doesn't mean that you don't have growth to do, right? <laughs> Like, I have lots of growth to do. That doesn't mean I'm not whole right now. It's just, it means I understand there are things I don't know. There are experiences I, don't, I haven't had. There are mistakes that I make. There are hard, there's harm that I do. And I, like, I need to, like, grow and be, be better. I'm not, you know, none of, none of us is perfect, even if all of us is whole. Well, it's those perennial fights about amazing grace that some people cannot bear to say, saved a wretch like me. And I'm like, really? You don't feel like a wretch sometimes? Like, who are you? I, I just, I can't even relate to somebody who, who can't relate to that. I mean, no, we don't want to just steep ourselves in shame and say we are nothing. God is everything. You know, we don't want to do that. But that's really different from saying sometimes I am a wretch and I need grace or something bigger to help me, you know. So I think when we refuse to open, we lose that that healing that can come. We need humility, humility with a capital H and all the other letters need to be. In we need shouty caps humility. It's December's theme for CLF, humility. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Jess, what are you, where are we next? And like, oh, what, where are yeah. we in the year by now? Or is it summer, are we on break? Well, so we've got, <laughs> right, so then we skip over a few months. Um, and when we came back in the fall, we did um, prison ministry. We talked about the doctrine of discovery. We uh, visited with Takia Amin um, on Blue, um, and then we had our uh, we had Trans Faith and Faith Formation with uh, Jalen Scott, and that was that was September when we came back. And you know, because Meg made the the, the shameless fundraising plug last week, I'll do it this week. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the CLF Prison Ministry is really quite an amazing, transformative, life-changing, life-affirming, life-saving ministry. And um, if, if you haven't seen fit to support CLF in doing that work, I hope that all of you listening and watching will do so as an end of the year gift. You just made Hannah our social media guru super happy right there michael oh, she's gonna pull that out. I, 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 live, I live to make hannah super happy <laughs> yeah the prison ministry i think what's so amazing about it is it's 910 now and it's we don't average it's all evangelically done within the prisons by leadership from the incarcerated members who are sharing good news with each other 
And I just find that so moving that so much better than any other Unitarian Universalist I've ever met. They are sharing our faith with one another because it's saving their lives. And whenever people say to me that this faith is just for privileged people and blah, 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 I just say, I have so many letters that prove that that is not true. Not true. That, that people, the spiritual practice, the drawing from many sources, the, all of that is, uh, the prisoners are literally dying for it. So, yeah. It was fun to have Takiya come. You know, we used to have blue every month for a long time until they got so busy. And it was fun because Dr. Takiya Amin had been hired to come and do sort of program, um, pro program director. No, that's not it. Director of content, director of content. It was some title I'd never heard before. And I thought it was, I, it's always fun to see how people do this. And she is, I think, one of the most creative programmatic thinkers I've ever met in my life. And uh, so it's really fun to watch Blue. They they started out, you know, nesting under CLF and they're, they're well on their way to be an independent organization. We'll kind of miss them, but it's great. And um, yeah, so it's great to have her. And then Jay Lynn, I think about that show a lot. That's one that I just, and, and her ministry is just blows my mind. Um, she's been on a couple times now, but about faith development. Um, it, it was such a gift to have somebody really deepening in and holding that space uh, to, to reflect on what faith development uh, for trans folks is like. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, truthfully, I don't remember the content of it. It's what Maya Angelou said. I don't remember what she said. I remember how she felt and she felt like a minister and I felt ministered to myself as a cis person. And I just thought what a gift she was. And I heard from some trans people who watched it, how ministered to, they felt from it and um, yeah, shout out to her. So to keep us rolling along, we had a really awesome guest on October 18th, a couple of awesome guests um, on collaborative leadership. <laughs> Was that October already? Heavens to Betsy. Yeah. <laughs> what did you all think of that show? Since I kind of one of those guests, I'd rather you all weigh in. That was a great show, I think. Um, and one of the ones that um, that I walked away from thinking a lot about just because of entering into professional ministry and um, I had just recently passed the MFC at that point. <laughs> and um, thinking about shared leadership and collaborative leadership and um, how just important that is going forward. I think so many of the topics of this year that we've talked about, um, when we think in terms of um, anti-racist work, like collaborative and shared ministry is a, you know, a piece of that that's just really super important to, to take the power from the model where we were talking about at the beginning of this show, where it's one person at the top who knows everything. And usually that's a white cis male. Um, and, you know, turn that on its head. And the, the, then the, um, the people have the shared power, the, there's shared power in leadership. And it's, you know, so much more interesting and, and dynamic and, and then less frightening. I mean, that idea that I would have to come out of seminary and know everything um, and be able to go into a congregation and tell people what to do is just not even my style or desire or, you know, um, but to think that, that we all share, everybody in the congregation and shares in the ministry of the congregation, we all have our ministries um, and that that's what I get to work with and promote and, and help people discover. And, and, um, and then in that way, like doing anti-racism work on myself is critical. I mean, then there's no question that I have to do that work, that everyone has to do that work. Um, so we don't fall back into those old models um, of white supremacy. 
not just the anti-oppression work, though. It's every single aspect of all the work, I think. I mean, what you say is really true, Jess, but I've had kind of an odd career because I'm really heading towards retirement in the next few years, and I've never been a traditional parish minister. So right now, as I've mentioned before, I'm sharing with two other people uh, an interim position. And we are constantly, and one of the people is a person of color. First of all, I'm constantly in awe that anyone does this job alone. I mean, I, I really am. I know, I know that there are teams and there, but, but, um, and, and the people get thrown out of seminary into these congregations and that it ever works. I, I'm, I'm just, especially for people of color, but for anyone, I, I'm just awed by it. Um, there has to be alchemy at work. But I, over and over, I'm saved by the collaboration. You know, I, over and over, I think I wouldn't like this alone. <laughs> this would not be fun. And with the three of us, it's genuinely fun. I mean, we're having a great time. Even the horrible things, even the microaggressions against the person of color, there's a place to come and process them all the time. And, um, I know there are all kinds of collaborative teams. This isn't the only one where ministers are collaborative, but I really think, um, and I, I hope CLF functions, I, it does, because I, a lot of the learning fellows know a ton of stuff I don't know, for instance. <laughs> so nobody ever thinks, like, especially with technology, I'm the klutziest person there. So nobody ever says, oh, the senior minister will know much of anything. But um, I, I feel like, this is about our faith. We have a covenantal faith. So collaboration isn't tangential. It's not like an add-on. It is the very center of who we are. And um, so, yeah, that show, and I'm really excited about the book, and I don't know when you have time to write it with everything else you're doing. Every time you name a new committee, I'm like, when are you going to write that book? <laughs> but, um, yeah, I just... I feel like we've barely touched it. I think Blue has done some great modeling for us all on the collective leadership. I think that the three presidents did some great modeling, the two moderators, you know, that there's some really creative uh, stuff going on. But, you know, I've just wondered what if ministry was less a monogamous heteropatriarchal model of marriage and more of a community sense of here are the people in our area. This person loves this. This person loves this. How do we piece together? You know, um, so I never said that quite before, but it really is about like when you go to ordinations, they're like a marriage, you know? So I wonder what part of that we got from Catholicism as I say it. Well, and you know, it's, you know, it's part of our model that, that we think we're doing this alone. Even, you know, if, even if we're the only paid professional we're not alone. I mean, unless we're sitting in a room preaching to no one, um, in which case I don't know who's paying us. You know, I, I, I think that, you know, part of like this path of humility is understanding that each of us brings strengths and gifts to the, to the table. And, you know, I love being collaborative. And yes, it's always more fun when there are more people on the team. Um, and I love, you know, having interns and student ministers because I'm the only ministerial staff in the congregation. But even, you know, when it's just me, it's me and, and the religious educator I work with and the lay leadership and the community ministers who are affiliated with us and, you know, the, the ministers and religious educators in the neighboring congregations that we're doing things with. Um, so. I think it's it's part of white supremacy culture that we think we're doing we ever think we're doing this alone. Uh, I will name that as part of white supremacy culture. Yep, <laughs> thank you because it's true. Um, and I and and even I think when there's this narrative that it works anywhere, I always say. I wonder what that means. You know, what, what is it? How do dictatorships really work? I mean, is it like, you know, when people just decree something and we're the most anti-authoritarian group out there, maybe anarchists might be more, but, and I think the idea that we have folks doubling down on authoritarianism to a group of it and then blame the group. And I'm like, 
but that's who we are and we embrace it. So what does it look like to actually co-create a faith? And it doesn't mean no accountability. That's one thing now I've been very much, there has to be accountability. Collaboration is, is actually, to me, I feel more accountable now that I report to the board and both Christina and I are in congregations where there's a staff leadership team and the three of us report to the board. And so I feel way more accountable to more people um, than I did when I reported to one person. Shall we keep, shall we try to capture the rest of these? Okay. Um, so what about Nate's show? Cause yeah, I was really... so that was the next one after that. We had F bombs to pipe bombs, the consequences of political contempt. What do you want to say about it, Aisha? Well, that was one of the shows that I think um, was super compelling because one of our challenges is naming and naming reality and uncomfortable reality to people who want to pretend reality isn't what it is. So, I mean, yes, there was some element element of the show where we talked about John Fortune and Nate Walker were on the show um, about the meta of Trump supporters and how we and I think to me to me it felt like well. Let's actually talk about our congregations and the people who don't want to use words that make them sad and, and then somehow alter, you know, alter antagonistic reality into words that are palatable. I don't, you know, so I, I was really, it was a compelling show to me to have that discussion about how this plays out in our congregations, even more so than um, the idea of having to affirm a Trump supporter. I mean, I, I'm less, I have less feeling about that. I can affirm people's humanity and disagree with them, but what does it look like when it shows up in our congregations? It was a really, I, was, I think we can even repeat that show in the new year because it was a, I found it a very compelling conversation. I just remember that I broke the F-bomb barrier, which Christina has taken up breaking that barrier. And I thought it would be great. Christina <laughs> ran with that. It's really hard for me because when I joined the show, I, I, I realized like on the first episode that there was a clear like no cursing culture. And I thought like, is it an FCC thing or a podcast? Like I was trying to like literally in my mind figure out how to do this. And then later I, I was like, oh, no, it's just a cultural thing. I'm fine. <laughs> I just talk the way I usually talk. <laughs> so it's uh yeah it is and it's been an interesting journey to be the newest uh, co-host of the view this year and i love that it was not one of your co-hosts from new york or new jersey who broke that barrier i am a sailor's daughter so um, i do come by it honestly <laughs> and we joke in my family that my husband who curses way more than I do, but never in front of our children. Um, and I talk the way I talk and, and our kids have, have seen and experienced me in all my glory much more than, than their father. Jess, what about the rest of the year? We got four minutes. Okay, we had a, a great show supporting our trans community. Um, if you all remember that, Alex Capitan, Chris McElroy, Jalen Scott was back on and Don Fortune. Um, we had um, Allison Miller come on with a little post midterm election roundup. Um, and then we had a, a Lareda update. Um, to sort of close out the year. Um, we had, um, oh, well, and I'll say, I remember the post-election roundup show because um, I said something sort of racist and stupid. And then Asia called me out on it and I had to lean into my white humility <laughs> as opposed to my white fragility, which is my new thing that I learned from Allie Henney on Facebook, um, who writes about this stuff a bunch. Um, yeah, leaning into white humility, which I think is a really important thing to, uh, for white folks to, to put into their mind. Um, Cause there is that moment of choice where you can get defensive and um, be fragile, or you can try to move back 
and uh, be quiet for a second listen. Well, we're not going to get through the rest of the shows, but I, I, I think we had drum and ARE, I know. Um, but I do want to name that when the trans hosts and guests were talking, it was right after the federal government had basically said trans people don't exist and we're going to make sure that you don't exist. Um, and what I was moved by during that show was the, the honest acknowledgement from people that they knew they needed care and they knew it wasn't going to come in UU congregations, that they knew. Um, but they didn't know where you know, they, they were, I, there was such an honesty in that, the rawness of that time of, and, and it just made me think like we really need to figure out care for attacked communities. That's very personal. I can't remember which one of the hosts or guests said, you know, memes on Facebook really aren't helpful. <laughs> you know, they're not, they're not going to make me feel better, really. I mean, because I think that's for those of us who are privileged to say, I'm not part of that, I, you know. So I just, um, I really was struck by that, uh, the, the vulnerability and the, my knowing that this is a growing edge for me to figure out. Leslie Mack always says, after there's another horrible thing that happens, call the black women you know, call them. And I always go, yes, but I don't. I just go, yes, I should. But after that happened, I think because I'm the parent of a trans kid, so it was the most personal kind of assault, I, I was like, she said, call them. She meant call them. She didn't mean affirm the idea of calling them. And um, so it, it, I think that's what I was hearing in that show is really, we are the people who have to reach out with bodies and casseroles and whatever else we reach out with um, in those moments. Uh, that's, what, that's what church is for. That's what church could do. And um, so anyway, I wanted to lift that up. Um, I also was really moved by the drum and the ARE. Um, again, collaboration. They both talked about um, different roles for different people in the movement to try to get off the dime that we've been on my whole career, which is now coming on 30 years in this movement. Same dime, different words. Just not the right words yet, but when the words are right, it's all going to work. So anyway... Well, can we, um, and then just give one last, before we go, um, the Michael Crumpler show um, from last week, which was um, interesting to me and how the Welcoming Congregation Renewal Program is um, intersectional, like, and, and um, you know, working on being intersectional, um, which was really interesting and learning, learning for me. I will say that being here and being serving even my little congregation a little bit, besides CLF, I am aware of so many things I don't do that I could and so many resources that are available to me to offer the people in my congregation that I don't. And it's humbling and it's really wonderful because I'm like, wait a minute, I, we need to renew. Who, I didn't even know that. We need, you know, there are just so many things that you know, drum wants lay people to know they exist. All the things that people have come and said that I've taken back into my world. And I hope, you know, I really hope that this show is of service for people who are doing this work in our congregations to say, there's a resource, there's a way to think of it, there's a way to talk about it, there's a frame. Uh, we have fun talking to each other, but um, I think we're all here because we want to serve the movement. So. I, I hope that we are. I'd love to hear just really briefly from each of you kind of how this being on the show affects you and, and your sense of the faith, whoever wants to jump in. So I appreciate that when I walked up to Meg in Providence and said, why don't you have a religious educator on The View? <laughs> Two months later, I got, do you want to be on The View? I'm like, yes. No, um, one minute later, I was like, wait, are you saying you want to come on? True. Come on. <laughs> But it was your summer hiatus. And, and one of the things that was has been genuinely inspiring, frankly, Meg, is your leadership in co-creating and, and ideas and how we co-create this show together and opportunities for um, maybe things we didn't, you know, we, we're better together because we bring such a diversity of experiences and and who we know. And so I'm genuinely inspired. And I've always been inspired by your leadership. I've, I've known you a long time. So I appreciate this space and, and being on here. It's been uh, a joy. 
you know, I'll say for me, it's uh, it's such a pleasure to be in a space with all of you that um, when when we come up with with things that might be interesting. So so here's your peek behind the scenes of the view, uh, listeners and viewers. We you know we have conversations all the time about interesting things that we might want to have on the show. And it's not just, is that interesting enough to have it on the show? Because that would be a very low bar. But does it actually like serve the movement, the, the Unitarian Universalist movement? Does it actually serve our, our mission to present things uh, in an anti-oppressive uh, way? Um, and we ask those questions of each other so that you know we're not trying to just bring interesting things. We're trying to bring interesting things that have like a point to them that move us forward. And that's, it's such a pleasure to, to be part of that. I appreciate the opportunity, like the really intentional opportunity to, to talk about these things for, for an hour um, with you all. Um, and I, like Michael said, I appreciate the collaboration leading up to what the, the episode is going to be about and who the, the you know, guests are gonna be. Um, but just to really like, you know, usually around Tuesday, I'm starting to think about what the topic, you know, what I think about the topic, what other people think about the topic, what I've read about it, what I've heard from other people. Um, and so I, re I really appreciate that opportunity. Jess, I, I see that uh, guests are chiming in and that's wonderful. And Aisha says, hey guests, why don't you suggest shows and guests that you'd like to see in 2019. So if you have ideas, you could send them to, and if you know one of us, great. If you wanna post it um, on the uh, CLF page, if you wanna reach out to me, um, Jess can put my email into uh, the chat, but um, any of us would love your ideas for good shows, including yourselves, don't be shy, because I see some pretty exciting people who are writing little notes here. Jess, you want to say anything about how this show um, has affected your, because you're just, as you said, brand new coming in as you've become a minister while doing the show. Right. Well, and I'm not even exaggerating when I say it, the view helped me get through the MFC because there were, there were topics that we had that, um, that we have had that, um, were critical to my formation. There were um, books that, that I was reading and um, then we would discuss them on this show or talk to the um, people who wrote them or whatever. I mean, it was such a great um, learning lab for me. Um, and I'm so grateful to all of you for your just generosity with me and um, just letting me hang out with y'all. And um, yeah, I've loved it. And to you viewers, thank you so much. It, your words are sweet and the notes that you write and um, it, you you make the show. So if, if you weren't there, we wouldn't do it. So without you, we're nothing. Thank you so much. Happy New Year. Happy New Merry Year. Christmas. Happy New Year. Happy Merry.